So all of that was just to say, good luck on your voyage yes. to Houston. I mean, <laughs> oh, I know. I didn't sign up for this. Wait, wait, wait. This week on Backward Compatible, Richard is moving to Pennsylvania to get his PhD. So he joins us for a send-off episode where we discuss the past and future directions of Backward Compatible and gaming journalism in general. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, everybody. I'm here with the Backward Compatible podcast, a voice returning for uh, a, a brief... Uh, what do we call this? Interlude before I go back off to the other side of the country? We'll call it this, the, uh, the send-off. The send-off. There you go. All right, this is Richard. I'm <laughs> here with episode 29. And, of course, Adam, Jim, and Chris are here. Hello. Hello. Yo, yo. And what are we here to talk about today? Well, first of all, I'd just like to mention that you guys traveled through time and space without me. Just, we did. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was cool. <laughs> Why 42? I mean, I know that it's the ultimate answer to everything, but... That's basically... I mean, if you're going to travel through time and space, why go to anywhere but the answer to everything? Right. Fair enough. What are you going to do leading up to the answer to everything? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Or maybe, it, maybe I already did know at some point. And then I forgot. <laughs> Fair enough. We're just going to answer everything. They'll just have to tune in for the next 12 episodes. <laughs> there you go. There you we go. solved paradoxes, though. We figured it out. Really? Yeah, when you come back from the future, you forget everything you learned. Mm-hmm. Oh. It makes perfect sense. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, incidentally, I was also traveling through time and space, I like to say, because space-wise, going halfway across the globe, which was kind of cool, and then uh, time-wise, like, I got there, and essentially, I was flying for seven hours, but I got there, uh, how many hours later was it? Took off from Newark around four o'clock and got there in Germany at seven o'clock in the morning. So I was flying, practically speaking, for uh, 15 hours. 15, 16 hours. Wow. He's yeah. a real-time traveler. Yeah. <laughs> and then coming back, uh, the flight only took four hours, um, even though it was 10. So you're so. going to tell us why you were doing this? Yes, I was at the Digger conference. Yay. Uh, so, oh, it was Digger. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, some interesting stuff occurred, which I will not get into right now. Um, <laughs> but That was Digger as the digital, because it's uppercase D and then lowercase I, oh, yeah. and then GRA's Games Research Association. Digital Games Research Association. Yeah. Yeah, I know one acronym. Woo! <laughs> it was an apostrophe. Like, you know, Tilk. <laughs> I would accept that more. Uh, the whole... <laughs> some some letters are uppercase, some letters are lowercase. It always yeah. bugs me. It just yeah. bugs the crap out of me. Like, hmm, we can't really say dura, so let's put an I in there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Can I buy a vowel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was a good conference overall. It was good stuff. So, when, when I mentioned things that happened, that was all external. So, mm-hmm. I, I injured my foot walking around Lunenburg. That was fun. So. Don't injure yourself in a foreign country. <laughs> yeah, it's generally not a good idea. So, uh, I was limping the whole time, which was interesting for a country where you walk everywhere you go. Yeah, I so. know, right? <laughs> My only injuries overseas have been from the fact that, you know, I'm generally somebody who doesn't walk anywhere. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> when I go to England or Portugal or something and I'm walking for a week straight... Mm-hmm. That didn't tend to go so well. Mm-hmm. So you alluded, we alluded to the fact that Richard is uh, leaving. This is the send off. So how about you tell us uh, why it is you're leaving? Well, I'm starting my PhD at uh, Penn State's Information Sciences and Technology Program. So I'll be traveling to the other side of the U.S., going from Texas to someplace cold. Uh, <laughs> congratulations, <laughs> though. On, on thank you. I game. appreciate mm-hmm. that. It's been a long time coming. Six <laughs> long years. Yep. Yep. Uh, but I, I understand you got like a fellowship lined up and then teaching work after that, so it's all paid for. And... Yeah, yeah. I had actually accepted their initial offer, and then the graduate coordinator called me, and she was like, hey, so you accepted too quick for us to send you this properly, but we want to give you more. So <laughs> they gave me a graduate research fellowship, uh, which basically means that I get to focus on my own stuff for the first year, and she said that she's going to try and get it renewed for a second year as well. But basically it's a sizable pay bump and uh, I don't have to actually work well work in the sense of like a 20 hour a week job usually you have to you know be a research assistant or something Mm -hmm. but nope also but I was invited to come up early this summer so I'll actually be leaving in about two and a half three weeks now oh wow so and you have your place all lined up to live right yeah we got a fancy new townhouse I'm gonna be working as a research assistant for Dr. Jack Carroll it's gonna be pretty awesome sweet so doc what's been going on with you 
Oh. Your changes in your life. Uh, yeah, well, um, I'm also moving a glorious eight minutes away. Hmm. So this so is why... I, are you going to be okay? Yeah, it'll be all right. <laughs> are the cats going to adjust? They, they'll be okay. Um, it, this this is why you guys are surrounded in, in cardboard boxes right now, <laughs> like on all sides. Hmm. Is because... Oh, I need to go get some from you all. That's hmm. occurring. Yeah. But, yeah. Um... Other than that, I'm, I'm also going back to school. Uh, one master's is not enough, so I decided to go get an MA this time. My first one's an MED. Mm-hmm. And so, a little bit of a downgrade. Yeah, <laughs> but I found a program. It's, it's through Houston Baptist University, so it's a very unusual program. It is called Cultural Apologetics, and it's not technically a religion degree, uh, which is what I was not looking for specifically, right. um, but it is actually a humanities degree. It builds off of the idea of, of humanities. So we actually read Beowulf and things like that, and then cool. we'll talk about it within a uh, the context of their, their school, which is the School of Christian Thought. So it's pretty exciting. Huh. It's run by a, a Catholic woman hmm. who used to be an atheist, and her book is Confessions of a Female Atheist, um, Dr. Ordway. So okay. I'm going to be working under her. So I'm pretty excited about it. It's a 100% online option. So... That's, of course, uh, that's why I'm moving eight minutes away. No, it has nothing to do with it yeah, at all. No. <laughs> but right now they're underwater, so they actually have Yeah, to as Jim up. knows, Houston is not a place where you want to be. No. Ever, basically. Well, <laughs> ever. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with that one. Our, our condolences to Rockets fans, yes. by the way. When I did, um, I actually was following that series. I am a Rockets fan. But um, <laughs> I did, Houston is the main, is the city itself. It's got its pros and cons, mm-hmm. and there's some parts of it that are okay. I just didn't like the woodlands. I hated the woodlands. Yeah. Sorry if there's a listener from the woodlands. I actually used to live in the woodlands um, when I was really, yeah, I really just, little. I couldn't handle it. It's just the people are just... It combines like the horrible Houston weather with like pretentious Californian attitude, and it's just <laughs> too much. Too much. Something's got to give somewhere. Okay. Plus trees. Too many trees. Too many trees. I too many trees. 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 Yes. I mean, Man, where I grew up in Houston, I grew up in uh, Humble, Texas. Yes. And every single street is named tree or wood or something. <laughs> and there's I, no trees anywhere? Correct. My yeah, tree, I've, been, I've been to Humble. It's my tree is function. off of the intersection <laughs> yeah. of timber forest and forest timbers. <laughs> No. Not even nice. joking. No. No. Uh, <laughs> forest timbers and timber forest. And oh, then man. I turn. you turn onto moose wood and then turn onto shin wood. And that, yeah, that's where I live. Wow. Uh, well, there's a lot of tree-based uh, names as well in the woodlands, but I guess it's a little bit more uh, relevant. I guess. That being said, though, I, I definitely think if you were living there for a while, you would also feel it, like it's just too much. You know, it's kind of funny, though. I happened to read an article this morning that uh, during this past recession... Part of Houston's huge job growth has been the lumber industry. So, I don't know. Maybe that's why everything is like Kingwood, Woodlands, etc. Maybe it's because we actually have a healthy logging industry, which I was never aware of Mm. because I was like, you know, a kid. Well, now there's a healthy river system. So, (laughs) there we go. There we go. A friend of mine lives uh, in a condo right next to a river, and he's been posting steady updates to his Facebook as the river starts to go up and up and up. (laughs) (laughs) Get a time lapse going. Yeah, and he he had to abandon uh, his place, like get his car out of the garage because he lives in a condo where the first floor is just his garage and then everything else is upstairs in the second and third floor. Uh, so he's lucky that his house isn't really flooding but his garage is now covered in about like two to three inches of water as the uh, river like gets up and up. Wow. It, the flooding around there's no joke, honestly. I, when I did live in the woodlands, I remember... Um, there was a flood that happened there, and in our neighborhood, fortunately, we were in part of the higher areas of the neighborhood, so we weren't affected. Um, but, I mean, there were whole portions that yeah. were completely underwater. I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Where, where, like, entire neighborhoods were underwater. Yeah. Like, like the, up to the like, roof. Like, literally, the like, rooftop. the entire house yeah. was yeah. underwater, and it was ridiculous. Yeah. and it didn't affect us either. It was the same thing. We got a little bit of water inside, but we were on a high enough Houston hill. weather, man. But that's, but, yeah, <laughs> it's humid, and then it's flooded. It's flooded. It's it's just, like, and then, like, I was eight or nine when, uh, what was it, blizzard? Alice or something, Ice Storm Alice or whatever yeah. came through and froze everything, huge icicles, mm-hmm. and then uh, a series of three hurricanes, and then just ridiculous. It's too much. It's too much. It's not, it's <laughs> don't, it. Just don't live in Houston. It's, it's not worth it. Well, I mean, because <laughs> like you know, even in like in Texas history class, I forget who it was that said it exactly. But when Texas was a republic, the temporary capital was in Houston for a while, and people would talk about while they were you know governing there how miserable a city it was and why they need to change yeah. the capital it's, to. It's all it's Austin. all the weather. I mean, you're you're basically just living <laughs> in a swamp, and it's it's terrible. You're living in a swamp, but 
you know, you don't have any of that like cool swamp gas around. So. <laughs> cool swamp, swamp gas. gas is cool. Well, it, compared to what you get instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> like you get smog instead. So all of that was just to say, good luck on your voyage yes. to Houston. I mean, oh, I, no, I didn't sign up for this. Wait, where, 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 where are you moving? Oh, where Pennsylvania. Are you moving? Oh yeah, yes. that's right. Penn yes. State. All right. So. Doc is only uh, only going to Houston in spirit. Like it's a remote. Yeah. Remotely in Houston. Yeah, I, I will be. Um, you know. Which like, the only way to travel to Houston. Te- te- teleporting <laughs> in virtually. Well, so I'm not the only one who's, you know, leaving, though. I mean, I know that you guys have been producing content together for a while now, but you guys are about to officially do the relaunch of the website, right? Yep. Yes. So the whole rebranding, remarketing, etc. Yep, we, uh, we switched servers, um, switched hosting plans, and as a result, um, we kind of botched the, uh, the transfer of the site from one server to the other. Oh, good. Um, lessons <laughs> learned, so next time hopefully it will go better. It was all the old content. We, 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 yeah. fired, we fired it's, the guy responsible for that. So yeah, like, oh, fair enough. Oh, wait, what? Why are you still here, Chris? <laughs> I, I traveled through time and space, corrected my, oh, my problem. So this is the me that didn't screw up. Oh, The that me it? that did screw up is still stuck in the other timeline. Wait, but didn't you... Aren't you supposed to forget everything when you come back? Didn't we establish that? Oh, I, I haven't been to the future yet. Oh, that's other Chris. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, but no, in all seriousness, we, we did back everything up, so technically we have everything, and if I was tech-savvy enough, I could probably figure out how to recover it. We, we don't buy... have tech master's degrees. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, <laughs> actually the, the issue was more that the the way, it, the way you are supposed to export the data from a WordPress site is a little bit different. So yeah. he has the information, but he forgot to export it properly. Yeah, yeah. So it's there, but it's there in like raw data form. Mm-hmm. So even if he, so I don't actually know if there's a way to take that and then feed it through like a WordPress in some way that it just fixes it. And I don't think there is. WordPress translator. Yeah. 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 Top, top comment, like that, that one plugin that fixes everything you messed up. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> but so, so I'm, we're going through and we're trying to, to sort of set it up and, and have sort of a, a, a relaunch of the site and, um, exploring new ideas and new content and mm-hmm. moving, uh, moving away from the, um, the written portion and focusing more on audio content because I know we've mentioned, um, I believe we mentioned before in the podcast, I know we've mentioned before, um, in, personally to one another just how much uh journalism uh in terms of internet journalism in general uh gaming journalism as well is just dead it's all it's all clickbait it's all stuff that people well and not only is you know the written form of journalism clickbait and stuff like that but you know i think dead is a really appropriate word like um you know uh one of the more prominent uh faces of i guess like independent or I don't want to say unprofessional, but like user-based journalism is uh, Total Biscuit. Do you guys know him? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Total Biscuit is really, really loud with how much he hates traditional journalism. He thinks that written form games journalism is just Mm -hmm. something that is wrong that should go away. I don't agree with him on everything, but I do like him, and I think he's right in this this case. I I do agree with him in this case, and I do think that... Um, I do think, generally speaking, he is a, a good voice for, mm-hmm. for gaming. Um, yeah, I think that it really depends on what you're trying to communicate, right? Right. You know, so, like, I follow a lot of people that are, like, academics on uh, Patreon. Mm-hmm. Um, people still do the whole, you know, if I want to communicate something I've been theorizing about, I'm going to write up this, you know, long-form treatise instead of... I'm not going to record a podcast to communicate to you my critical thoughts on this one particular minute subject that fits into this niche. Yeah. This doesn't really work, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. can't establish a podcast audience off. Well, maybe you can. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. But yeah, for the most part, games journalism and games analysis by and large probably doesn't belong in the purely written state, you know, prose. Right. Especially given that you're, you're taking something that is an interactive uh, medium that that it feeds off of all of your senses. So you know it's it's not just a visual thing. It's I mean, right. it's not just text. It's you, you see moving pictures and you've got all the sound and, and you can even which is you know maybe an explanation for why pretty much every piece of games journalism has gifs in it now. Mm. But that might just more <laughs> internet, <laughs> internet culture think, at large. Thing. I think that also that actually bugs me a lot more because that is something that is. It's, uh, cheap. It's, it's going everywhere too. In turn, it's not just like it's games for you. It's like basically every inter- internet site now is like relying on that so much. Yeah, it's not really content. It's not really based on conveying information like journalism originally was. Right. Instead, it's about how do we get clicks, and it's all about putting out put, putting your opinion out there in a way that is um, controversial and divisive enough that people will be like. Who I don't know if it hinges about? on controversy, but I do think that it's lazy. 
You know, I yeah. I hate to sound like, you know, darn those kids and their interwebs, but <laughs> I think that... I'll say it if you won't. Basically, it feels like what they're doing is taking traditional written form content, and because most people don't want to read that, they fill it with GIFs to make it interesting mm-hmm. for the, the internet people, you know, I, as if digital natives just can't sit down and focus on an article, which, I mean, hey, maybe not. <laughs> well, I mean, but, at the same time, too, as much as one might bemoan the, the movement away from the written form and kind of deep thought sort of like reading words you do have to admit that there is it's more engaging to watch a video than to read something yourself yeah and right. i wouldn't say right. that deep thought is you mm-hmm. know isn't mutually exclude or is mutually exclusive to the written form mm-hmm. you know in fact um i did a presentation for one of my last classes this past semester uh, and almost all of it was you know case studies of people going on big dialogues in youtube videos like now the feminism debate is happening on youtube you know the uh, state of game design is happening on twitch you know all these people are voicing their opinions and showing their case studies in video form you know it's very rare to see anything written nowadays mm-hmm. that isn't a graphical comparison between different games yeah. it seems and, and mm-hmm. i mean you can see even on i'm um, going into the youtube stuff i mean it's all sorts of different philosophies that people will you know, go up and, and talk about just about anything under the sun that you can think of. Mm-hmm. There's a YouTube channel that's probably talking about it. Maybe not well, <laughs> but they're probably yeah. talking about it. And then there's also, if if enough people watch it, there'll be rebuttal videos yeah. that, will, that will come on, and sometimes those will be more popular. Than and it's really videos. surprising it's what kind of audiences these channels have been able to... I mean, you know, and this isn't just a YouTube thing by itself, but, mm-hmm. uh, like, what's the boogie numbers the francis the oh, yeah, really yeah, overweight yeah. guy yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know he has uh, an enormous following right? but i can't stand to listen to him <laughs> i think <laughs> that he has serious trouble articulating his thoughts in an effective manner uh but one of the videos i just stumbled across of his recently uh was talking about like uh, the girl gamer drama, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. some people like to put that label on people, and it had like 750,000 views and I could only listen to the first 45 seconds of it because he just can't articulate himself, but I mean, hey. Still counts as a view. Yeah, still counts. Still counts as a view. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, there was something else. You, you, you were talking about this on Facebook a while back, Richard, and I remember I commented, uh, maybe it wasn't directly related to what you were talking about, mm-hmm. but just an observation of mine, that now that everyone basically has instant access to all this information, the biggest news stories everyone's going to know about in five minutes because everyone reports on it, essentially. Yeah, okay. So old school journalism where you like have like you know the one, two, or three sources of news – that you really need to inform everyone who reads these three things what's going on. Everyone, in some way or another, knows the basics of what's happening. See. And then it becomes about the the reaction. You're basically you're, you're going to people more for their personality and their take on the news more than you're going to them for the news. But I, my, I, which I have a huge problem with that, and mm-hmm. the reason being that you never you don't actually get the source. You're getting yeah. what people say about it. Mm-hmm. Right. So we, we very rarely actually get unless unless there's a straight up video that uh, you, you can watch of what's happening. Instead, you get, here's my interpretation of mm-hmm. what's happening, but I'm not going to actually tell you what's happening in an unbiased yeah, manner. Yeah. So for all you know, you're just getting my view on it, and then someone else will give their view on it. And, yeah. you and then the way that you accept what is actually real is going to be somewhere based on what you already believe, and mm-hmm. you're, oh, you're going to filter through your own mm-hmm. you know, preconceptions. And you're going to tend to follow people who are like-minded, and, so you're only getting yeah. one and then, sort of And angle. then you look at the people that are, that are not going, not, they're thinking differently from you, and you go, well, that person's an idiot. He this should is know so that funny this because, is the way that it is. <clears throat> it's so funny because this last semester, the, my final one, I took a uh, journalism and mass media communication class in which like we talked about all of these things at length. Yeah. And I can't just regurgitate everything, but you know, what you just talked about with people's content being colored by their own perceptions. Right. There's this big notion in print journalism called the gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. And it's the different levels of, of you know, obfuscation and deciding what goes out and who sees what and what social policies different companies have. And that's sort of the issue that you have all the time online. You know, with Twitter, you know, Twitter reported the Ferguson events right when they started happening just right. immediately it's just millions i think i looked at the numbers like seven million tweets were sent in the first day or something like that uh and the traditional online news didn't report on ferguson for like a whole 24 hours mm-hmm. uh buzzfeed was the first website to have an actual written form 
article of all about places. For, w- right, <laughs> you know. But that just goes to show. And surely it was a fantastic piece. Oh yeah, I think it was titled something <laughs> like you know violence in the streets or you know so- something that painted Something's the people. Something's happening in Ferguson. Yeah, and you won't believe it. <laughs> and you won't believe it. <laughs> Is it the Pulitzer Prize that goes to journalists? Yes. Or am I thinking yeah. something else? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the Pulitzer. The Pulitzer for the BuzzFeed guy. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Clearly. Or gal, I don't know. <laughs> but you know, that's. I think this relates back to every sphere of journalism or you know written prose. That you know, really, that's just not what people are navigating to online anymore. Right. You know? well, I mean, even when I took journalism in high school and they were sort of teaching us the old school print methods, um, they would always talk about too how you put the most important information at the top and sort of the anecdotal, the extra stuff near the bottom because you didn't expect people to read the entire article. So you're trying to communicate the essential stuff first, and then if they happen to keep reading, it's there, but you're not counting on it at all. And Mm -hmm. that is the reason why some of us older guys still have not adapted yet to the video and the audio um, change. Because it's kind of expect you to watch the whole thing. Well, or yeah, listen to the whole thing. it does. Yeah. And that's the problem is that whenever I see a video, the very first thing that I do is I check to see how long it is. Uh, because I want to know whether or not I'm going to be willing to dedicate eight minutes to find out mm-hmm. this thing. Or maybe I should just Google it and get a, a, a print thing and know in 30 seconds. Yeah, that's... Um... So, what I mentioned earlier about going to YouTube for things like, I don't know, like, specifically feminism, um, there was this interesting event uh, on both Twitch and YouTube um, where this prominent League of Legends streamer started talking about um, female streamers and how they would, uh, a small number of them will garner viewers by playing games on stream in, like, low-cut tops, or they'll, you know, yes. if they get a donation, they'll, like, dance around, you know. Or playing in their underwear. Sure. Exactly what talking Which, about. yeah, happens a lot. Um, but so he decided to make a video. Ba- basically, it came off as attacking these people, and uh, that sparked later on. He was streaming again, and a bunch of people came to his stream, pulled him into a Skype chat, and it turned into a two and a half hour long dialogue of him, which he streamed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was just YouTube celebrity after Twitch celebrity after internet persona just started getting added and added to this Skype call. And it became this big dialogue. And, you know... As somebody who studied the whole gamer gay, you know, every aspect of this issue pretty thoroughly because I'm interested in the social studies of gamer culture, mm-hmm. why did I sit through two and a half hours of random gamers talking about this on YouTube in a very casual and unstructured format? I mean, I've heard every single one of their talking points before, but sure enough, I sat through the entire two and a half hour long video and it wasn't in the background or anything. I was engaged the whole time. And I think it's because these mediums are just inherently a little bit more engaging and they appeal to us a lot more than the written form, right? You know, that's kind of obvious. Mm. If you were to transcribe that, you're not reading that entire thing. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) You know, you're not going to read all of this audio, but the fact that you're inner... It feels almost like you're interfacing with real people. You know, it's almost kind of the news anchor of our day, Mm. right? Because we don't really have... I mean, we still have, like... Well, not anymore, but Brian Williams, you know, and Anderson Cooper. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we have those people that they have their regular audience, but really, you know, that has now navigated to YouTube. There's a lot of people that when they want an opinion about a game, or if they want an opinion about a social issue, they go to the same person. They go to their YouTube channels that Mm -hmm. they follow. I I mean, I hate to sound like an old fogey, but I do feel that that's, we've lost something there, because I do think that... While you still have that, they're giving their opinion to an extent with the news anchors, they, there's always going to be a little bit of a, a opinion put into it. Mm-hmm. At least these are people that are, generally speaking, highly educated and are surrounded by... Trained professionals. ...by news. They're, they have certain standards they have to live up to. And when you're just going to some and random... And there are YouTube, for not right. doing it well. And when you just go to some you know, YouTube professional, what have, professional, what have you... Partner. Um, yeah, it's... <laughs> They're not going to have the same sort of... Um, Absolutely. And there's, I mean, there's def- definitely something to be said for the fact that everybody and, has their opinion and, by and the their way, voice. Just, just because you go to college, including graduate school, doesn't necessarily mean that you are you are qualified in any way <laughs> yeah. to speak on any social issue yeah, at sure. all. Absolutely. So let's, let's 
throw that out there as well. Or even the issue that you got a degree. Or even the issue you got a degree in, possibly. <laughs> so I'm sorry, that is true. Yeah, but regardless, I think the the new direction that you guys are going, relating all of this back, mm -hmm. you know, focusing more on the audio, I think, you, did you say you are going to be doing some video stuff as well? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So focusing more on the new media angle as opposed to the article form, I think is a, a really insightful approach because, you know... While it may be a problem, maybe, now that people are getting their social commentary from random well, gamers on YouTube, and it, and it's... Me, go, sorry, go ahead. I'll finish. Well, I'll just wrap up by saying it's yeah. definitely a sign that that's where things are going, and more professionals, as you put it, right. need to be in that space. Yeah. Like, an, like Anita Sarkeesian. Yes. I know that you're not the biggest fan, but, you know, the fact that that conversation is happening on YouTube as opposed no, to BuzzFeed articles. It's important. Yeah, I agree. And it's definitely important to have a conversation. Yeah. I just I just don't like the concept of someone being considered just an authority just because sure. they talk about it. No, absolutely. That's, that's, but, that's my only issue. Yeah, but, but that's definitely... Other, other than that, that's more an issue of the people doing that, not mm -hmm. necessarily the, the individual. Right. Um, I, I just do think that the important part about people finding their... Um, the person that they're... That they trust, you know, to give them advice, like to their opinion on like a, any sort of issue, whether it's a game or, or a social issue. I, it's of course less important for a game, but I do think it's very important to remember that you need to consider all issues, all sides, everything, and then sort of you know look at it holistically and come to your own conclusion, as opposed to this is the person that I trust to give me information. Right. So, so I, I don't want to be. Yeah. Uh, I'll, say, I'll throw this out there. I don't want anyone to hear what I to hear something that I say and go, "Well, this person, I'm going to listen to what he says." And go, so like, I well, want to go back to the to, Total to Biscuit example. Personally critical. Yeah. Yeah. To go back to the Total Biscuit example, this guy is somebody who has produced hundreds and well, thousands, honestly, of hours of games criticism and critical thought. So I will trust his opinions on you know, the state of games journalism, and right. I will consider him an authority there, but if he suddenly started speaking up about, you know, men's right activists, or, you know, just whatever, right. any sort of relevant issue, just because I, have like yeah, the, just because I go right. to his channel every day doesn't mean that he has any sort of credibility in that sphere, <laughs> and I think that 20, 30 years from now, maybe shorter, maybe longer, you know, we'll start to see YouTube or just online forums in general have the spaces for every single one of these discussions, you know? Yeah, and I think it's important. I, I do think that it's important to have those discussions. I just think it's also important to not feel as though you, you've come to a conclusion and you close yourself off to possibilities. Yeah. yeah. And I've it, always been the sort of person our, that I, I, like to, I like to stay open to everything. Every, it's just, just stay open and, and listen to other ideas. Because when you start closing yourself off, and you say, this is the way it is, the problem with doing that is that now, anytime you hear someone say something different, you look at them a little differently. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're sort of, uh, you know, they're maybe dumber, or maybe even your enemy. They're a threat so, to your worldview. Like right, Chris. they're a threat. So, <laughs> but you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't feel that way. You should be like, well, they feel differently, and maybe I have something to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't necessarily agree with what they're saying. So it's, I think there's a, that we have a lot to learn from each other. That sounds too hippie-ish, but that's something that I, I do believe very strongly. And it's actually like a bit ironic, and maybe ironic's not the right word, but in this age when we have unprecedented access to every angle on every issue we could possibly want, um, we choose to ignore the vast majority of them. Sometimes just because we that's don't know also about true. them. But or, we also don't right. seek them out. You know, to go back to the current state of games journalism, like... I mentioned earlier the graphical comparisons, right? Yes. Uh, I think you guys have said that you haven't played The Witcher 3 yet, right? Not yet. Oh, I've, I've wanted to, but I have not yet. Oh my god, it's amazing. But <laughs> <laughs> there's currently this big stink that's been going around because there is a quote-unquote graphical downgrade from E3, which oh, yeah. what game hasn't suffered some sort of graphical downgrade from E3 or like, oh, the trailer didn't right. live up to the... But, you know, regardless... This is the sort of thing that our games media focuses on. I'd say, seriously, with the release of every single AAA title that is cross-platform, Kotaku and Polygon have published an article comparing the graphics for every mm -hmm. game, as if that were even remotely important. Like, really? Unfo unfortunately, that's for the uh, for the console fanboys. Uh, they want to know, is yeah. my console have the strongest one? And if so, I'll go gloat. Yeah. And if not, I'll, I'll, I'll say, this is... I am sure total, it gets them travesty. all this the clicks. Yeah, I'm sure it gets them all the clicks, yeah. all the views. But... 
Like really? No, I agree. For every game, I I think it's insulting to the you know the intelligence of gamers to think. Well, and I think it's insulting for developers as well. Like CD Projekt Red, the people who made The Witcher, they're an independent studio. Mm -hmm. They don't have Mm -hmm. a publisher. You can see it in The Witcher. Like they they have made a lot of gameplay conceits and a lot of polished conceits to deliver you the best MVP game, most viable product of their game, and. It doesn't have a lot of the bells and whistles. Like, there's not a detailed cutscene for everything. That's what. I, know, that's actually what I like about their games. Honestly, yeah, is, absolutely. Is that, is that element? It's like they're more focused on the, the game. I mean, really, yeah, they they're, recycle a lot of the NPCs you talk to in terms of like the model of the character. Right. Like, and I like it. You know, it's something that you just don't need, uh, and yet. When they released this game, which, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, The Witcher 3 has an amazing narrative, which is based off of a series of uh, books from mm-hmm. a pretty famous Polish mm-hmm. writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, not all of them have been translated yet, but I think they're almost done. But it's pretty phenomenal. It's basically the more magical Game of Thrones of the video games world. Uh, and this is being relegated to a talk of... Does it look better on the PS4 or the Xbox One? <laughs> like, are, are people well, getting, does people it, getting Richard, outraged? Does that, it? Because uh, like, th- there, uh, there have been other stories related to this where people are just outraged that the previews they were showing, like when they first announced the PS4, for instance, they showed like you know a, a gameplay sample from Uncharted 4. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then now they're showing an updated, basically the same scene with the new engine. Yeah. And it doesn't look nearly as good. And people are like, oh, see, they're selling us these lies and all this different stuff. It's like, I don't care. It still looks awesome. You know, it's like, tell me about the game you know i don't i don't care if maybe the graphics don't look quite as good as they first pitched because i didn't buy a ps4 for the graphics i bought a ps4 because it's the thing that's going to be supporting the newest games you guys remember the ghostbusters game when it came out Mm -hmm. ps3 era yes Um, ghostbusters it was really actually a sequel and it should have been ghostbusters 3 i mean it was it was fantastic it tied in the first two movies together and and made it explain why things happened the way they did but um the amazing thing about it, the cool thing about it was it was the Wii era as well. And it was yeah. co-released the same game on Wii mm-hmm. and on PS3 and, and also for Xbox. Uh, whichever one that was. <laughs> I can't 360, keep up with the sequencing anymore. 360. Yeah. Um, but what they did for Wii was they just stripped out everything and they just redid the graphics entirely as a cartoon. Oh. And it looked like the old, I guess it was, what, 90s cartoon? Mm-hmm. The, yeah. That's yeah, what the, it looked like. The, the late 80s, 80s. So it's 90s. almost an entirely different game. Almost. But they because they had the original actors do all the voice work, it was a brilliant game. Uh, it's worth picking up out of the bargain bin. But huh. um, honestly, I would play it on both systems because they're fundamentally different experiences. Um, and, and the Wii, while you, while you still can, you know, uh, before Wii goes the way of the Wii... Um, <laughs> Because you've got sure that, that, that element, I don't know, <laughs> but you've got that element, you know, don't cross the streams There's and all that, there. you actually have a, a purpose for holding the Wiimote. And I love those games that, that feel like they're supposed to be Oh, so it did have them. motion controls. Oh, yeah, it did. For, like, the laser. Very much, and they redesigned those controls. But what they did was they basically redid the game, but it was the same plot and the same um, sound. Interesting. It was the same recordings. But it was just a fundamentally game, different gameplay experience. To me, that's... That's what the focus should be on whenever there's a difference between these games. I mean, think of, look at the original Dragon Age, right? Um, Origins. You play that on PC, you've played a different game than you played on console. Mm-hmm. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, one was about strategy and telling your team what to do and, and watching it happen, and the other was directly controlling your character. Mm-hmm. And, More of an action and RPG. It's a button pusher. Yeah. So Which, they not have the, like... Um, Relaying orders, Neverwinter Nights style of like top down stuff in the. They console did, version. but it was simplified. Okay. In the console version, it was simplified, and what you did was you switched to that character and you did mm-hmm. it yourself. Yeah. It was and much then, more focused on and the Inquisition, they brought back kind of the top down thing, like you sort of pause the game and you can issue commands, but I never use it because I was just so used to the old style of just interesting control yeah, the character, give commands. Yeah, that's why I never really got into Dragon Age mm-hmm. was because mm-hmm. of the the first one I thought was okay, but then the other mm-hmm. two when they went and I played it on PC. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, when they switched to the more actiony, you know, concept, mm-hmm. I just even from the start, I wasn't really sold on it. But mm-hmm. I'm not well, really a huge yeah. uh, a, a fan of that sort of melding of, of like if, if it's going to be an action RPG, I want it to just kind of go full bore and be something like Legend of Zelda. I don't really want the um, that sort of like half half ass mixture. Are we able to say ass? 
half ass. I don't know what to get with the FCC. This. Okay, the FCC. Say, say as because that is that is half an ass. Okay, there we go. The ass. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't really like that. Um, where you're playing an RPG now, but you're really not is the way that I feel. Yeah. Um, going back to an earlier point too, and um, you know, like you were talking about comparing the gameplay differences between mm-hmm. consoles um, as being more important than graphics. The graphics can sometimes, or things related to the graphics, can still be important. Um, for instance, I think it was Bayonetta, that when it came out on Xbox 360 and PS3, the PS3 version was essentially just ported from the Xbox 360 version. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it was uh, had extremely slow load times, a few you know technical bugs, yeah. and stuff like that that's like really significant. Now, that, that can is, impact the experience. Yeah. And so that and then it's worth knowing, okay, if I've got both consoles, I want to buy it on the Xbox. Yeah. Right. Um, but, right. you know, like getting down to the nitty-gritty of like, oh, this one's got, you know, better anti-aliasing on the shadows or something like that. It's like, I, don't care. Yeah. I mean, of course, those websites are going to produce the content that gets them the views and they're giving the people what they want, essentially. But, um, I don't know. I just... Well, I'll, I'll throw a net over this and you tell me whether or not you think that, that this is a true way to summarize it. Um, a couple years back, and, and Richard, you may, you may remember some of this, uh, I actually wrote some essays on this idea of authenticity and validity. And one of the very first... As essay in audio that I want to to read and post for the new site for, for launch is actually this um, video games and authenticity and validity. And I think what we've been talking about is exactly that. We're talking about highly authentic sources. We're talking about, um, you know, this guy is just like me. I could be this guy. He's got three million views, three million hits, whatever it is. But... I could be him, and that's empowering and that's exciting because of the authenticity of the voice. Even the even the bad grammar and the inability to articulate well it kind of plays into this idea Absolutely. of the, mm-hmm. the common man idea. Whereas whenever you're looking at you know these highly valid sources, these um, you know game magazines that all the went quote digital. unquote professionals, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what you're talking about is extremely valid sources. They've got the credentials. They have, well, you know, just like a news announcer, they have something to lose if they do it badly. They have a name rather than a personality. They have a name behind them as right. well. Um, and yeah, I mean, some of them do obviously have personalities. I mean, right, have... but I mean, it's like, it's Kotaku rather than the Angry Joe show, yeah. you know? But I would I would look at it as a spectrum, and that's what I actually proposed um, in back in uh, about five, five years ago, four years ago. I don't remember when I did it now. But it, the idea that there's actually a sliding scale of the spectrum between this idea of uh, authenticity and validity and something like Kotaku's right smack in the middle. Because what they're doing is they're emulating this authenticity and they're seeking the authenticity. And because of it, they've reached a new level of validity. And so the irony, of course, is that they're not a valid resource. and They, they never were, but they have enough hits that you kind of think of them as one. Mm-hmm. And so it reaches its own level of, of validity just by having the... I guess presence. Mm. You know what I'm saying? No, and, you're you're right. And I so mean, I, it's one of the most like all those Gawker media sites are extremely. Um, are, I guess popular is the word to use. They they get the hits. Yeah, they back yeah. it up. And Kotaku's the most like mm. known name among gaming. But it's sites, schlocky, I would say. And you know, it it's is. yellow journalism. It is. And, and you know that's not saying that they don't have you know uh, the occasional piece that's you know some of their writers actually at Kotaku they're damn good writers. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But they don't have the Direction and consistency across their content to actually be considered valid or, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, actually, credible. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. But word understand for it. that that's by design. Sure. Yeah. It, it's not that they accidentally stumbled into fame like some of these guys. No, do. no. I mean, you look at somebody like the Yogs cast; those guys are great. But they they stumbled into fame, and actually they've they've struggled trying to keep that fame. They've got mm. their seven million subscribers or whatever it is, and and they're kind of hanging there. Um, but. You know, that, that's that's more entertainment even than anything else. When you're looking at, at these um, pseudo journalistic outlets like that, yeah, it's a whole different ball game. And a lot of these guys designed their their sites to be this way, and they hire based on that. And if you look at their submission policies, mm-hmm. it's based on that, and it's it's form writing, and it's intended to evoke an emotional response. And they don't even care what that emotional response is. Mm-hmm. You know, it can be hatred, it can be anger, it can be. You know, yeah, they, they want they want people whether they like it or not to want to share it with someone else. And if you, know, you hate and, it, you're more likely to share it even farther. Exactly. And there may be nothing wrong, obviously, with producing that kind of content. I mean, sure, there are some people out there who really care about the graphical comparisons of you know different cross platform releases. But it's kind of a shame, at least I think, when 
you for the most part have those articles. And then occasionally you have an article like one that Polygon published uh, that was an investigative piece into gray market retailers, which are yes. um, G2A, uh, Kinguin, etc., yeah. where you basically buy your game codes from a third party at much discounted prices. And uh, I actually was uh, asked for a quote for this article that one of their writers produced. And it was really nice to see them. I mean, the guy did like weeks and weeks of actual investigative reporting. He like interviewed people who sold the games, interviewed people who basically stole the codes from developers. And, you know, he really got down and dirty with the people that he talked to. And it definitely wasn't a, you know, new bug in The Witcher causes you to lose XP, yeah. you know. That's because, right. I mean, that's journalism. What you're describing, that is actual journalism. Yeah. That's not what we normally get from those sites. That's real journalism. Because you're investigating, you're looking for mm -hmm. the truth, and you're, you're reporting on it. Yeah. And it's just a shame to see that, and then now, like this morning, you know, um, I think it was either IGN or Kotaku published an article that was, new game-breaking Witcher 3 bug causes you to stop gaining experience at a certain level, publishers looking into it. And then, within ten minutes, my newsfeed had all of the other gaming sites post the exact same article in their own words, with a slightly different headline, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. Basically just regurgitating everybody else's content, which is a real shame. You know, yeah. one, this was a point of conversation uh, in my journalism class where, you know, back in the day, you didn't really have this as often because, you know, your print went out, you know, for the week um, in physical form, right? You couldn't see that another paper had published this and then immediately publish your own, right? That's just not right. how it worked. Mm -hmm. And my professor referred to it as the steak versus ramen noodle concept or inferior versus normal goods. So if we compare traditional journalism to the normal good, it's like, oh, this is the good, this is the steak. This is what I want. This is the standard tried and true good content. Then digital media is highly regarded amongst most consumers and scholars as the ramen noodle to the steak. It's an inferior good. It's something that's produced like that, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why one website publishes an article on any topic, and within ten minutes you can regurgitate that exact same thing with enough changes to not be plagiarism with a new headline that will get just as many clicks because, ooh, maybe they wrote something different about this. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's content. That's a shame. The third paragraph will make you gasp. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they love that, too. <laughs> oh, God. Number seven made me cry. The yeah. lists. <laughs> yeah, all of the lists. I hate those, too. Uh. But um, but yeah, but the other reason too that we're moving more toward the audio content is just because you know not that we weren't busy before as students, but now like you know we've graduated and we're moving on or back going back to school actually. Yeah. Um, but you know we're but it's online school. <laughs> it's, not, it's not real school, right? It's not real school. <laughs> um, but you know we're we've just been, we were too busy and we are too busy really to put in. We we found that the amount of time it took to write a good article. And to, you know, do whatever research and gathering of material and stuff like that we needed. Um, it just wasn't really worth the effort, we found. Yeah. We were putting out too little content too slowly. And, and this here way... we just start spewing a bunch of stuff into a microphone. Oh, no, exactly. <laughs> well, it's great. I think, I think the, the, different, the difference, too, it's like, um, you know, there's, there's a little bit less prep work. But mm -hmm. also, um, we can incorporate just playing a game and then talking about it versus mm -hmm. the, the possible backup in terms of the writing. But in addition, there's <clears> the issue of... How many how many people are we actually getting and that are actually readers for the, all the work that we're putting in for the content? One know? of the things that I really like too about these like comparing the two different forms is the idea of an authority versus a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, so with the written form article, you kind of have to come across as an authority or at least self assign authority. And, and right? Even if you say that you're not, that's the implication that the re exactly. that many readers will have that this person must know what they're talking about because they wrote it down. That's Whereas the you know, down. Yeah. for like say across the past six years or whatever of the undergrad and masters, some of my favorite moments were when we would hold like a house party or something and we've had, had we would have anywhere from 50 to 100 people over to one of the houses and it would devolve into at five in the morning we're all just kind of you know nursing some drinks sitting in a circle just talking about games like talking about different design elements talking about some project somebody's working on about one of our colleagues who's working with a publisher to get something up on steam you know and that's 
that kind of conversation, that dialogue, has always been much more fulfilling than one person's account mm. of, or one person's authoritative telling of what the state of this game is. Well, because essentially what you're trying to do when you're writing an article like that is, in a way, try to anticipate the questions they'll be coming or the the responses they'll be coming, and you're trying yeah. to address all those. And when you're just sort of stuck in your own head, um, you can miss a whole bunch. But when you're having a conversation, you can make a point, someone else brings up something you wouldn't have thought of, and then you can get a much... On a broader conversation, a much deeper. You conversation. might even have a, you know some sort of a personal insight where you'll realize, oh, maybe maybe I didn't think about that before, and you... which happens so often. Yeah, <laughs> and that, those are great moments. Some of my best ideas, actually, the thing that I went to Portugal for a conference over was basically somebody else had like gave me this idea during a conversation, and I went off and did the research and turned it into a paper. Like, awesome. So, like some of these conversations are you know, what allow you to reach a higher level of critical thought. So I think the audio content is a much better direction to go, honestly. Especially because, like you said, just sometimes you play a game and talk about it. I love that, and I think some really great insight comes from that. I think if you all just play a game and talk about it critically and extend that into discussions of general design elements, discuss um, the nature of the environment the game was released into. I mean, you can talk about it in any number of contexts, and I think it's going to be much more effective than writing a 1,500-word article about some, you know, element that you think you're an authority on. So, right. Word. <laughs> no, not well. I guess words, but not written <laughs> words, spoken words. Spoken word, yes. Um, and of course, some of the other cons we'll be producing as well, which I think we've touched on before, is um, we're going to be doing uh, kind of like this improvisational um, audio role playing thing, where we're going to take a fairly rules light system. And we're going to try to tell stories with it. Oh, um, so not I take off this, my Roman wizard hat. No. <laughs> no, this is going to quiet. This is going to be um, a completely audio. So it's going to be sort of presented almost like a radio play. Oh, cool! Um, it's going to be very structured. Be, yeah, structured radio play. It's going to be focused a lot on the narrative element, less so on the mechanics. All right. So I like it. There's going to be that. Um, we're going to do, I think we mentioned the uh, the audio essays. Um, so essentially, instead of writing an article, if we ever have something that we've done before, something we want to sort of, you know, when we do have the itch to kind of write an article. Or, or, or something that we just want to say. Yeah. You know, like maybe we just want to, we want to get on and it's sort of like an audio, like a monologue or an audio presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just want to get on to say something. Yeah. But it's just going to be a monologue. You're not going to like follow it up with conversation or... Um, the not, idea is yeah. that it's just sort of a presentation of, of, of some sort of content, mm -hmm. okay. just in an audio form. But, of course, the site will it, it hopefully get more, but what still encourages comments. So mm -hmm. the idea is that hopefully we'll get comments back on these. You know, uh, Doc puts up his um, authenticity validity um, essay, right. and maybe someone comes back and comments and says, hey, you know, I, I kind of like what you were saying here, but here's my take on it, and maybe you have a response. Exactly. And that's definitely and Doc says, do you have a PhD? <laughs> Get off my website. <laughs> that's right. <clears throat> and only if it's good will we respond to it, as we uh, remind you each week. No, I'm kidding. Not only if it's good, but those are the ones that are most likely to get the responses from us. So do be thoughtful. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this particular feature, though, mm -hmm. because, um, I mean, Richard, you're, you're a published author. Mm -hmm. And so this is an opportunity, if you wanted to, to record some stuff, throw it on, still you know, keep contributing mm -hmm. content. Yeah, potentially. Um, and I think it's less about the individual entries, although, you know, those are those are kind of fun, than it is the body of work that's going to come out of it as a collection of audio essays. I think mm -hmm. that a year from now, whenever we have you know, uh, a dozen or two up there, I think it's going to be really exciting and really interesting. So we're already looking at some contributions from Brian McKittrick, who's been um, on the podcast before, and um, some others and um, we're kind of corralling others. So um, mm -hmm. I, I'm really hoping we get to the point where we can take submissions and, and yeah, let, that would be great. let I submitted think, essays be a part, or editorials, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I think it's an interesting exploration of the New Media Scholar and seeing what forms it'll take. You know, there's this really excellent website, I don't know if it's still all that active, but um, called First Person Scholar, and it's a website that is all submission-driven, but it's all academic articles, like articles that you could pitch to a conference, maybe like a low-tier, mid-tier conference, um, and it's all just random submissions. And the uh, chairs of the website, the uh, steering committee, if you will, 
are established game scholars. You know, they're people with large bodies of work, and you usually get either student or burgeoning scholars that submit here, and they, they submit traditional articles. You know, I think there's definitely a place for the audio equivalent of that, or the podcast equivalent of that, or the video, you know. So I think that that's a really interesting venue for you to be exploring. Nice. Oh, awesome. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, do we want to kind of... Um, do a little bit of a retrospective on where the site's been and that sort of thing. Any Memories. sort of <laughs> favorite moments from uh, Richard's time here, perhaps, or uh, anything along those lines. Moments. <laughs> hmm. Can we really decide? <laughs> yeah, let's. I mean, what well, is your? Do you have a favorite moment? Uh, all these moments are like my children's. What? <laughs> it's a strong <laughs> matter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, I know when we started, we, we it sort of I everything think my, sort of changed as we went. Yeah, from mm-hmm. our original idea, partially because initially we had um, who's been on the podcast, Ben. Yeah, ben. Ben. that's uh, ben exactly Mirabal, what I was thinking about. He had a very different, and that was sort of a lot of where the new media mm-hmm. side was was pushing from because he doesn't really, he's not really a gamer. He doesn't really have that mm-hmm. that background. So he kind of brought a very different voice. He's a fogey. Ben, you're a fogey. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, and I think we had that idea of the, the very different voices initially. Which Over the first few podcasts, our voice definitely evolved quite a bit. And I think one of the things I enjoyed the most was when we really got the format down. And we always, like started every podcast with the game or right. the trivia. Yeah, you know, and at first we started with the trivia, like everybody come up with your answers to what were your more, most challenging moments? Did mm-hmm. you ever cheat in a game or, you know, whatever. And we did that for the first few and then we were like, "Eh, that's a little too structured. Let's just move on to like a point of funny discussion." Or and then we moved on and you know, f- sort of finding our voice cuz we're all amateurs here. We're not yeah. professional professional podcast producers and you know I, I think that was fun i think and we also got to learn a bit about each other like i learned yeah. that chris actually likes the sonic games which <laughs> i mean blew me away I, yeah i mean I, who knew i associated people with such bad taste <laughs> <laughs> but no i mean that was that was fun you know i i really liked sort of exploring both the podcast space and exploring you know my colleagues that was nice because not, usually, not in that way or in that way (laughs) but like in an academic setting like we're usually in at the university it's you know you show up listen to a lecture or show up give your presentation and you're kind of done and then we socialize in normal social settings like parties or online games or whatever and so rarely do we ever get the whole round table idea and that's Like, if I remember correctly, that was our initial concept for the website. It stemmed from the fact that we wanted a roundtable discussion. Mm -hmm. and um, Right, we ended up doing it in article form. Right, and we tried doing the dialogue. Yeah. To the the dialogue form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, coincidentally, we're now sitting at a roundtable. Yes, Yes, we are. Quite literally. Yeah. I I remember that very first meeting. um, You guys all crammed into my little tiny office at the university (laughs) and uh, talked about it and gave the pitch. And I was just like, wow, that is a fantastic pitch. And so I've, I've been your biggest fan since the beginning. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, people exploring the idea of the non-standard article form. Polygon has done a couple of um, opinion pieces where they'll have a couple of their usual writing staff co-write articles, mm-hmm. and they'll have their different sections with like their names on top of it. Uh, and there will be uh, a couple of articles I've seen where they have basically an article that is constituted of quotes like from 10 different articles they just mishmash them together into one article you know and so people i think are constantly exploring the state of written prose so i think we were on the right track there with trying to have the round table article but i don't know didn't we find some like articles that were strangely similar that were shortly after we had put ours up not going to make any accusations. Because <laughs> I remember that happening, and we were like, hmm, seems like we do have some readers, but maybe not of the right kind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think um, 
uh, there's this one website I saw recently where they were doing... Actually, it was the one you linked um, about uh, Cards Against Humanity. Um, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was that uh, Sit Down and Shut Up or the other way around? Shut yeah, up I don't know. What, that was my first time visiting that website, mm-hmm. but I yeah, whatever they're called. But that, that <laughs> particular <laughs> article, though, was basically like each person took a couple of paragraphs and they each had their turn talking about the subject. And it kind of took on a conversational tone. It never even clicked tone. for me. Yeah, yeah, I never realized that that's what they were doing, but that's totally what yeah. they did. Yeah. yeah. So, cool stuff. Huh. All right. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's something that was great. You know, I felt I felt that that uh, when you do a podcast, I think that the different part about audio content as well as opposed to the written form articles that you do learn a lot more about the people that you're as you're with, and it takes on yeah. a more personal note as opposed to the that personality is something I think that's becoming increasingly important. I two things on that note. One, as I made a post about this a while back, but talking about how it seems that in today's sort of uh, media culture we care less and less about events and objects and even people to a certain extent we care about the personality in which something is conveyed you know like Mm -hmm. we have a lot of youtube channels that convey things in a certain style or tone uh, or with a, a certain figure or personality rather than critically looking at the content on, like, say, the Washington Post or, like, your standard form article. Um, you can have the best points in the world, but if you don't deliver them correctly, if someone doesn't like your tone, exactly. all of a sudden the entire point is... You moved. know, I, I've ever since I've decided to stop being a dinosaur and use Twitter, which, uh, admittedly, I've slacked off on that over the past few months, but I've built up, you know, a decent following. I think I broke a thousand, like, at the end of last year, and I started to have various websites reach out to me. I had... Uh, Vice reach out to me for a couple articles. Oh. I had um, Polygon ask me for that quote. Um, you know, so I've contributed to a couple of different journalistic websites. But most recently, I was reached out because some reporter found me when they were searching for empathy games, and that's one of my hmm. areas of research. And she asked me if I'd be willing to be interviewed for an article on empathy games, and I started to go through the process of interviewing. And it felt so, like, forced. Like, we were trying to fit this conversation into article form on a... So we were talking about games, right? An inherently interactive medium. Mm -hmm. We were talking about a social issue about games. So that becomes even more complex. (laughs) It was staged in an interview and was being translated into a written form article. It's like, okay, I need you to make all these points and one juicy quote. Yeah, and it just did did not work, and I eventually backed out of it, and I was like, I'm sorry, this just isn't working. Mm. You know, and I I think that's really indicative of journalism going forward. So, I'm really glad to see you guys making the changes you are, and I hope that it's reflective of the industry as a whole. Well, thank you. I think the biggest challenge is going to be the culture. Yeah. Um, not just gaming culture, although it applies. Just but, online culture. Online culture, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because what you're talking about, what we've been talking about, is the difference between crowdsourcing something and groupthink. Yeah. And crowdsourcing is a good thing when used correctly. Um, it's the driving force behind alternate reality games, which is what my background is in. And groupthink is a bad thing. Um, yeah. This is where mob thought happens. This is where and that's what I was people start too earlier burning yeah. down things on the street. You know, it is well everybody else is doing it, and it's not just it's not just about peer pressure with people you know. It's about an, an, a mob of unthinking people, and so or two I, mobs of unthinking people ramming into one another. Well, yeah, and and I guess that's what becomes really interesting <laughs> is. Um, Chris, just wait. The, the the primary is having me begun yet. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. We we have to have a political episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's politics and yeah, gaming. Politics yeah. and gaming. Yeah. Mm. Um, or games about politics, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. I'm already I'm already starting to to filter and mute on Facebook. It's just it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's one of those things where when when we come to stuff and we don't think. We don't think it through. Mm-hmm. We don't even know what we believe, but we think we know what we should believe because we're on a certain side, and that mm-hmm. side's, side's kind of defined for us. So, someone we like has said, I shouldn't like that thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and, and I, mean, I don't want to make it political, but uh, I saw a post today that was about that, and it, it was actually about Rick Santorum. 
which is funny. And it was quotes by Rick Santorum, and mm-hmm. it, it was posted by the Democrat. And, and it doesn't matter whether um, you know Republican or Democrat. Sure. That's not my point. Uh, but but the points that were being made, the quotes that were being made, actually looked pretty legit. And I think any uh, uh, self-respecting Republican would agree with the points that were on that post that he had made and the quotes that he had said if they were a Rick Santorum supporter. The irony was that it was posted by the Democratic Party and it was being posted as, do you see these terrible things that he has said? Ah! And the irony was some people are going to look at that exact same image and probably share that exact same image and go, yeah, we support this guy. And others are going to go, oh my gosh, it's a terrible thing. And and that that point was driven home to me back in 2008 with uh, the very first ele- you know Obama election. And um, somebody said, oh, did you know he's a smoker? <laughs> he's a smoker! <laughs> and the person that, was, that said that... Is a smoker. Well, no, no, the, the, person that, the person that said that was intending, <laughs> don't vote for a smoker, because smokers are, I don't know, they burn children or something. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> they smell well, bad. They, they, yeah, because they smell bad. I mean, you, can't, you can't really deny that. Right, exactly. And, and what's interesting is the audience, the intended <laughs> audience of that went, oh, and I quote, that poor man, you know how hard it is to quit smoking? I feel so bad for him. What? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it was such a silly, stupid thing, yeah, but it's why, a perfect example. I don't know. Because we have these preconceptions saying these inflammatory things, mm-hmm. and the, if we don't know our audience, um, which of course we can't because they're humans, they're going to react to it the way they're going to react to it. This is why, you know, yet another example of why this dialogue format is so important. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of the things I think holds true is that people of this generation, even the people that are on my side, you know, quote unquote, um, they can't actually defend any of the things they believe in. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so yeah. people that think of themselves as being socially conscious, like, oh, the poor people of Ferguson, oh, the poor women, oh, et cetera. And like, yeah, absolutely. These are all issues that I support vehemently. But if you support these issues, if you call yourself a liberal and you support these issues, but you can't actually speak critically about why you support them, mm. then your voice is just, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. Yeah. If, if you can't support an issue through your own voice, and all you can do is say, yeah, everything should be equal and happy and fun, no, your voice, I don't care about it, go away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think that this format is applicable and necessary in this age where information is just constantly overwhelming us. Mm. And, you know, you have all the BuzzFeed articles, all the Kotaku articles, and amidst all of the either inflammatory posts, the social posts, the graphical comparison posts, I think what we're really missing is more conversation and more dialogue. Yeah, so. yeah. You need you kind of need someone to process this deluge of information with, and you know, yeah. As we're processing it with each other here at this table, we also hope that we can process it with the audience, that the audience can process mm-hmm. it with us through the comments and through the interactions that we're going to have in that way. So, um, come along for the ride. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We want people to talk with us. We don't want to talk to them. So. <laughs> yes. We Wait, or, or, a hipster. <laughs> actually, we, can, we, can, we can talk to them, but we don't necessarily want to talk at them. There we go. So, awesome. Yeah, that. That. <laughs> you know, that actually kind of thematically brings us full circle back to the idea of apologetics, which is exactly why I'm doing the degree that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, by definition, apologetics is a, an, an extra-biblical examination of biblical concepts. And that's exactly what, what this program that I'm going into does, is it looks at things from the humanity's perspective. Um, so it looks at uh, Christian culture within the context of Beowulf, for example, you know, early English. So you read Beowulf and you study um, the the topics in that, you know, f- almost philosophically. Within so the- basically, we need to bring Ben back so that he can extra gaming, extra. Huh? I don't know. View gaming from without gaming. Yeah, and of yes. course, when he says extra biblically, he doesn't mean like. You know, extremely biblical. He means outside, like, outside, <laughs> outside of the Bible. Just, Stop insulting our viewership. <laughs> just, just, just to clarify. No, I'm kidding. I'm sure you guys knew that. The extreme yeah. 90s version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yes. It's, we're, this has just been one long commercial for Legends of the Hidden Temple. Oh, <laughs> oh my. 
<laughs> Don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> and on that note, I think it's about time for us to wrap it up. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the BackwardCompatible.com podcast episode number 29. Um, Richard. It's 43? Uh, no, it's, we, we've gone back in time. We've they, returned to our, yeah. to our normal timeline. Yes. Okay. I think. <laughs> so... Uh, um, this was the uh, kind of the quote unquote send off for Richard, um, but it, by no means do we want this to be the last time we see you, Richard. We want to keep talking. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> wait, 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 really? What? I mean, maybe I'm alone in this, but uh, did you talk to Adam about this? I mean, technically <laughs> I not. Send off meant like get like, out of my house, <laughs> <laughs> exile. But but uh, <laughs> Richard, Richard is leaving, so yes. Um, Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, uh, you know, have you on like maybe through Skype on the podcast every now and then. Those audio essays, maybe even uh, if we do role playing stuff, maybe get you as a guest on that. But um, because we're going to be looking for all sorts of guests um, as we produce these things. Well, we're always looking for more people to role play with us, Richard. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, do you have to wear the elf ears? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Don't forget your Roman wizard set. There we go. You won't believe Richard's response to that. Click here. <laughs> you won't believe what happens 45 seconds in. So. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, there we go. I'm sure there'll be someone that will figure out a way to do uh, clickbait podcasting where it's all about go, waiting for a certain point, but you can't skip ahead. You've right. gotta, you gotta, you got to wait for like the, like the one minute and 30 second mark. Segmenting out the different sections so you can click exactly where you yeah. want to go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, and then you have, like, the uh, the gated, like, every 30 minutes or whatever. You've got like, the ads. You've got the ad, yeah. yeah. So if you want to get to this point, you have to watch, like, the three segments worth of ads that you would have been skipping over, so. Yeah. Oh, stop. We should stop oh, giving yeah, people we, ideas. We're giving <laughs> oh, no, they, are, they already do it. Just Let's look just at end this podcast. Okay, yeah. Just <laughs> bye. This is why I don't subscribe to Hulu. <laughs> yeah. yeah, bye. Bye. Hi, Richard. Bye. Bye. Leaving the pencil. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us what you think about the state of gaming journalism, and what you'd like to see change. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.